I was just thinking when Gary was talking about, um, I'm not going to change the sermon, but um, when he was talking about the universe, and the Bible says that anyone who sees the universe with an open heart should see in it things that speak about God. Paul writes this in Romans, he says that in the creation we see God's eternal power and his divinity, that's to say his godness. So when we look at the creation and when we look at, we think of these extraordinary numbers that really our brain just can't cope with at all, we're supposed to begin to think, well, God actually created this and God's power is infinite. And we're supposed to think that God is God, that's to say he is in control of all this. That's what we see in the revelation and the creation of what God is like. But there were other things that God wanted to show us that he was like. Not just his eternal power and his divinity. God wanted to show us something else. And in John's Gospel, uh, it's expressed like this. It says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, that's Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. In other words, the creation shows us the greatness of God. It shows us God's amazing, unimaginable power. It shows us that God is in control of all things. But God wanted us to know something else. He wanted us to know the heart of God. So he sent Jesus from the bosom of the Father to reveal not just what God can do in terms of power and control, but to show what God's heart is like towards each other. And that's why in Christ we see just an amazing revelation of what God is like. And that's why Jesus on one occasion said to one of his own disciples, one of his own disciples said, my name Philip, he said, Lord, show us the Father and that will satisfy us. And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you such a long time and you've not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the revelation of the heart of God. And that makes it all the more amazing that sometimes the Lord Jesus said very severe things. Um, he said things that we think, well, we like to think of him being loving and kind, but he is... He is not just emotion. His love is sentiment. His love is truthful love. He speaks the truth. There's a, an old verse way back in the Proverbs, in the Old Testament, which says something like this. It says, The kisses of an enemy are deceitful, but the wounds of a faithful man are blessed. Sometimes God has to speak truth to us, which wounds us. Not because he enjoys the wounding, not at all, but because he has to speak truth to us. And I want to talk to you this morning about something which is really foundational in our relationship with God. I want to make it as simple as I can. And to do that, I'm going to look at three men in the Bible and show you something about these three men and show you the way in which their conscience worked. I want to talk to you this morning about your conscience. That isn't actually true. I want to talk to your conscience this morning about you. That's what I want to do. Uh, I want to speak to your spirit. Uh, I'm not going to do anything mystical or weird. I'm just trusting that God will make truth plain to your hearts as we look at something in the story of Luke's Gospel. In Luke's Gospel chapter 21 it is, chapter 23, sorry. This passage of scripture tells us about what we call the trials of Jesus. Jesus went uh, just prior to the crucifixion. Um, he was put through three trials. They were really not proper trials. They were illegal um, in the way that they were operated. They didn't fall the proper um, jurisdictional way of doing things. But I want to show you the reaction of three men to Jesus Christ in their conscience so that we can see it. And the first one is this. It begins like this in Luke chapter 23. 
It says, then the whole multitude of them arose and led Jesus to Pilate. He's just been arrested. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Let me explain what's happening here. The Jewish people at this time wanted to be rid of Jesus. He was a threat to their authority. He was a threat to the things that they believed. But because they were actually an occupied people, because they were under the jurisdiction of Rome, Rome did not give the Jewish people the right to carry out the death sentence. So the Jewish people could not carry out the death sentence, even though they wanted to do it. The Bible says that it had been predicted that a time would come when the Messiah would be handed over to the Gentiles, taken out of the authority of the Jewish people and put under the authority of the Gentiles. And this happened at this point, so this is what's going on here. So they bring an accusation to a man named Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was what's known as a procurator. That meant he was the representative of all the might and the power of Rome in another country. He was more than an ambassador. He was almost like a... He was like Rome in another country. He was like a kind of a vice regent or something like that. He ruled this country for Rome. He was a man with immense power. He had the power of life and death. He could do exactly what he wanted to do, and the power of Rome was behind him. And this man is the one who becomes involved in this. So they bring an accusation to Jesus that will get a guilty verdict from Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate isn't really interested in accusations about blasphemy and whether he's the son of God. The Romans were happy to have another son of God. They, sometimes they call their Caesars gods and their children were sons of God. That wasn't the big problem. But if you wanted to get Jesus in trouble with the Romans, what you needed to do is to say, actually, he's another king. He's a threat to Caesar. And that will get Pilate's ear. So that is how the story develops now. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowd, I find no fault in this man. You'll see several times Pilate, Pilate refers to Jesus as this man. This, is, it, this begins as a proper kind of a Roman court case. And what they've done is they've brought someone to the one who's going to act as judge, and they're bringing that accusation against him. This is the charge that's brought against him, that Jesus is actually wanting to start an insurrection, a rebellion, and that he will be a king, and he will get rid of the Roman authorities. That's the accusation they're bringing. But Pilate looks at him, hears what's said, and Pilate, this is Pilate's verdict to begin with. Verse 4. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. So his first judgment is, he's not guilty. And by implication, take him away. He shouldn't be here. There's no case to answer for this man. Then he goes on, it says, Then, but they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that Jesus belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he was like a kind of a, a puppet king, um, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. So Jesus went from a trial with the religious leaders, the priests and the rabbis, then he went to Pilate, Then, as soon as Pilate heard that Jesus came originally from Herod up in Galilee, Pilate saw an opportunity here to get out of this altogether. He doesn't need to make a decision. Let somebody else make this decision. There stands someone before him who is a king. Jesus said, you put the right label on it. That's what I am. But Pilate doesn't want to be involved in this. We'll find a little bit later on in the story that he's cautious because his wife has had a dream. And in this dream, she's seen something about Jesus and seen lots of terrible things happening 
if Jesus is found guilty. So she sends a message to her husband, and Pilate doesn't really want to get involved with this, so he sees a way out. And he says, well, send him somewhere else. Let somebody else make this decision. That's what some people do in their conscience. One of the things that Pilate says, is not in Luke's Gospel, it's in Matthew's Gospel, but at a certain point, Pilate asks this question, and I want you to ask this question. I want each one of you here this morning to ask this question. This is Pilate's question. What shall I do with this man who is called the Christ? What shall I do? I'm asking you, I want to speak to your conscience. What will you do with this man, Jesus, who is called Christ? Some people, like Pilate, will say, well, I'm not qualified to judge this. Let somebody else do this. Let somebody else make the decision. Let's send him to Herod. Let's, uh, that's me. I don't, I don't need to get involved with this thing. You can't do that. We'll see what happens in a minute. Pilate sends him to Herod, who was the Jewish kind of um, civil leader at that time. Goes on, when Pilate heard of the Galilee, of, the, of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. And then there's just a little bit of local history. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired a long time to see him. Because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Herod has a bit of a history. Herod had, had heard the preaching of a man named John the Baptist. John was a fearless preacher, and he said things that were very disturbing to Herod. But at a certain point, Herod listened to John and asked John's questions. And at a time when John the Baptist was in danger of having his life, ta life taken, Herod actually imprisoned John almost to kind of keep him safe. But ultimately, as a result of a dancing girl, and uh, you probably know the story of this, Salome, and this sort of a story, the thing is that John the Baptist is executed. A little bit later on, some people come to Jesus and they say, you need to get out of here and stop doing this because Herod is here and he wants to see you. And Jesus said something very strong. He said, go and tell that fox I'm going to carry on what I'm doing and nothing will stop me. That's my interpretation of it. It was a very strong statement. He actually called him a vixen. Go and, go and tell that vixen that um, I'm going to carry on with the job that God has given to me. This was a key moment for Herod. He was interested in Jesus. He'd heard stories about his teaching, about his miracles. And this was his opportunity here. Herod stands for someone who is curious. Are you curious about Jesus? Do you want to know more about this strange figure that dominates history in such an amazing way? Herod wanted to see him. And Herod hoped that Jesus would do his tricks. That he would do the things that he was famous for. Herod wanted to be entertained. He wanted to... He wanted Jesus to flick his fingers and do things. That was the way of it. But amazingly, if you follow the story in other parts, you'll find that when Herod asked these questions, Jesus didn't answer him a single word. Not a single word. Why would Jesus do that? Let me tell you what I think is happening. John the Baptist on one occasion was questioned as to, who, as to who he was. And he said, I'm not this, I'm not this, and I'm not that. And they said, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to the people who have asked us. And John the Baptist said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You have something which is called a conscience. And it's a voice that cries in the wilderness of your humanity. Each one of us have some sense of what is right or wrong. In some cultures, it will be more finely tuned than in other cultures, but each one of us has some sense. It's almost as though we've got inside of us a kind of a, a spiritual smoke alarm. Um, let me explain what I mean. You know that they have a machine that they sometimes call a lie detector, and they connect somebody up to this lie detector, and they monitor their heartbeat and their pulse and their temperature and all kinds of things. And then they ask questions. They ask some trial questions to 
see what happens when this person tells the truth and when they tell a lie, and then they begin to ask the questions. And when the person answers the question and tells a lie, nearly always something happens. Their blood pressure goes up, or their thoughts increases, or their temperature changes. It's almost as though on the inside of us we have a kind of a spiritual smoke detector. That in spite of the fact that we can become very practiced at telling lies, actually there's something in our body that knows it's wrong. And our body reacts to it. It's part of the working of this mysterious thing that God has given to each one of us called the conscience. When we see truth, there's something in us which bears witness to it. That says, yes, this is true. Now, some people, then ignore that. They ignore their conscience. So they go and do the thing they wanted to do in the first place. But if you keep on ignoring the conscience, if you silence the conscience, in the end you won't hear what God wants to say to you. That's why I said that this is significant, what happened with Herod. Herod executed John the Baptist. He silenced the voice of God. And so John called it himself. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Herod silenced the voice of God. And when the word of God, Jesus stood in front of him, he had nothing to say. He had so deadened his conscience that there was nothing that God could say to him in this situation. And Herod, well, we won't go to Herod, but he can pass off the scene for this part. Herod was disappointed that Jesus didn't do any of his tricks, so he sent him back to Pilate, who thought he'd got rid of this problem, but it, some people's conscience is like this. You kind of put something away and you think, that's it, I've, um, I've put it away, I've forgotten, I get on with life. And then somewhere up ahead in life, you suddenly find it ambushes you. And you discover, actually, it hasn't been forgotten, there's something still there. Pilate now listens to what Jesus has to say. Let me read this bit to you. Um, I'll read from verse 30. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to him, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things in which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. For I sent you back to him, and indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. And then, Pilate compromises. He thinks that he can get a bit of a breather. He can get a bit of peace of mind if this problem will just go away. And he thinks he can appease the people if he just punishes Jesus, just gives him a token beating or something like that. The people will say, yes, Pilate doesn't approve of him. That's good. And that will be the end of it. So what Pilate does, even though he knows Jesus is innocent, he goes against his conscience in order to give himself a bit of peace of mind. There is nothing so permanent as short-term compromise. When you compromise with the truth, it will have a devastating effect upon you. What Pilate was doing, he was, he was compromising with the truth. He thought a bit of peace and quiet was... All right, he was prepared to compromise and say, well, we'll give him a beating and then we'll let him go. He goes on to say this. For it was necessary for him to release one to them, to the, one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, away with this man. Release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. He was almost certainly um, a terrorist of a kind. Pilate, wishing, uh, therefore, wishing to release Jesus. You see, he knows this man is innocent. He wants to set him free, but he doesn't want the hassle. He doesn't want a rebellion from the Jews. He wants anything for a bit of peace and quiet. He will go against his conscience. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. And they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And then the people who were bringing the accusation 
played a particular trick. They said this, but they were insistent, demanding with a loud voice that he be crucified. And it tells us in other places that they said, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar's. So now Pilate was really on the hook. Because if it gets back to Caesar that Pilate has let someone who's claiming to be a king off the hook, Pilate is in big trouble. So, verse 24, Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And if you remember in the other stories, it tells us Pilate washed his hands. And he released to them the one that they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. So, as far as Pilate was concerned, it was over. He washed his hands. He said, this is nothing to do, to do with me. You go and do what you want. That's fine. We don't know what happened to Pilate. Well, we do know that later on he was actually sacked from his job as procurator and recalled to Rome. But we don't really know what happened to him after that. There are different legends of one kind or another. But there was a, a French author who wrote a story, I guess he intended it to be fiction, many years ago. And he wrote a story called The Procurator of Judea. And he invented his own ending for the story of Pilate. And he said that Pilate had made enough money as procurator to be able to retire when he actually lost the job. And that he returned to his family land in Sicily and lived the high life, living, um, drinking and womanizing and all the rest of it. As an old man, someone came to see him who had been a friend of his when Pilate had been the procurator of Judea. And they talked together about old times and they were reminiscing. And then the old friend said this to Pilate. I think this is one of the most chilling stories I've ever heard. He said this to Pilate, he said, do you remember when you were procurator of Judea and there was a, a young rabble rouser, a young firebrand named Jesus from Nazareth and there was a trial. Do you remember that? And the story goes on to say that Pilate kind of puckered his brow and thought of it. And he said, I can't recall that name. Is it possible to do that to your conscience? To so blot out the presence of Jesus, the Word of God, that you get to the stage well, you can't even think about it. He never comes to your mind anymore. Is it possible? I think it's possible. But let me tell you this, and I don't enjoy telling you this, but I think I need to tell you this. If Pontius Pilate didn't repent and didn't come to faith, personal faith in Christ, he will remember the events of that trial for eternity. For eternity, he will never forget it. He will never forget when he had the opportunity of surrendering to the one who was called Jesus the Christ and washed his hands. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? If there was anybody here who doesn't want the implications of having to surrender to Jesus Christ as the Christ, the King, and who says, No, I'm I'm going to put that away, I'm not going to think about it, it disturbs me, I'm going to live my life and seize the day and all the rest of it. And you may succeed in the short term, and you may be able to obliterate him so completely from your mind that you never think of him again, but I don't mean this as a joke when I say this. If you do that, you will hear my voice forever. You will spend an eternity re-listening to this sermon. One of the old Methodist preachers, this isn't a definition of hell, this is just his own personal description of hell. He said, hell is truth seen too late. Or is that your destiny? To see the truth but too late. I don't know whether Pilate repented. I don't know. 
If he didn't, he may indeed have obliterated the awkward scenes in Jerusalem from his mind and lived a life where he never thought of them again. But for eternity and a day, he will relive the trial. Jesus used very powerful language about hell. He said that in hell, the worms never stop chewing and the fires never go out. Now, I don't know whether you think those are literal fires and worms or whether it's a symbolic way of saying what I'm saying to you now, that actually the pain will go on forever for those who discover the truth too late. But there's another man in the story. He's here on a cross. <clears throat> Let me read from verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. There are some people who... If I were to tell you the gory details of the crucifixion, and the Bible never actually does that. It's very interesting how discreet the Bible is, how reserved the Bible is. The Bible usually simply says something like this. This is verse 20, 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. That's all. No stories about the pain that was caused. No stories about... The intense agony, those are all true, but that isn't the Bible's focus because what happened in his body was real, it was genuine, but it was actually symbolic of a deeper pain that was taking place in secret where no man could see. Where in the midst of his agony, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the passion of the cross. Not the things that Mel Gibson wants to tell you. The real passion, the real pain of the cross was his separation from his father when he carried your sins and my sins. So it doesn't concentrate on the nails and the jarring of the cross being put in position. It just simply says they crucified him there. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand. And when that happened, those two criminals heard Jesus do a remarkable thing. They were almost certainly themselves, they were terrorists, they were insurgents. And they were being put to death. And, and as they were being put to death, they've got this man on the center cross who's been put to death. And maybe they wonder what he will say. Will there be some angry rant that comes from him in the end? Will he bring down curses from heaven among the people who've done this to the truth? So will he do any of those things? What these two robbers actually here is Jesus saying this Father forgive them they don't know what they're doing in Matthew's gospel it tells us that both of these thieves, these robbers actually railed against Jesus, that means they they swore at him, they cursed him, they mocked him and that's how it started off but Luke tells us some very special details he tells us this then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. The people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him. This is an amazing story. In the Middle Ages, when Catholicism kind of ruled the whole land, there were some people who began to discover wonderful truth in the Bible about the salvation. It was the power of God to salvation to everyone that believed that Paul writes about in his Roman letter. 
And uh, as they kind of got deeper and deeper into his Roman letter, they found treasures there, wonderful things that set their hearts free. But there were some people who said, oh, you're just going too deep, you're getting too complicated with this. All we need is a theology of the repentant thief. Now that's, if, if we've got it, as much theology as he gave, much of Bible teaching as he had, that'll be sufficient for us. I want to show you how much theology, how much truth the repentant thief had. Listen to this. To begin with, they had both mocked Jesus. Then the one answering the other says, Do you not even fear God? He took God into consideration. That's where it all starts. It all starts when there's a pause in our lives and we begin to think, well, who did make this world and this earth and this universe? And is there a God? And if there is a God, does that have any implications for me? If there is a God, does he have any plan for my life? How does he expect me to live my life? So the first step is when we actually just pause and we begin to take God into consideration. There's a wonderful story that Jesus told that we call the prodigal son. And he'd gone away into the far country and he was sitting with the pigs and he was about to eat the pig swill that they were kind of eating. And then the Bible just says very simply, he came to himself. There was just kind of a moment of sanity in his life and he said, this is crazy. Even the servants at home in my father's hands have got enough to eat and I'm starving to death. He took his father into consideration. He remembered God. I don't know your background. I don't know many of you why you're here. I want to tell you that if you're going to get on God's flight path for your life, the first thing that you'll have to do is to take God seriously. You'll have to take him into consideration. You'll have to begin to think about it. You say, well, I'm not a theologian. It doesn't matter. Yet whatever ability you have, you'll have to begin to think about it about what God is like and what God expects. So this man, you may say, well, I live a very busy life. I've got all kinds of reasons. The, the man, this repentant thief, is hanging by his hands with nails through his wrists. If he can do this, you have no excuse. If he had enough sense to say, I need to take God into reckoning here with what's happened. This is what he said. Do you not fear God? And he's speaking, remember, sideways to the other thief. And he says, seeing that you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly. So he not only took God into consideration, but he recognized that sin has its consequence. We are under the same condemnation, and we justly. In other words, what this repentant thief is doing is he is recognizing he's a sinner. He isn't just recognizing that God has to be taken into account. He's recognizing that he has to take his own life into account. And he says, we are under the same condemnation. And for us, it's just. It, it, it's perfectly right that our sin should be punished by this particular punishment. It's another step that we have to take in our thinking, in our conscience. We have to begin to realize that if we have turned our back on the truth that God has made real to our hearts, if we turn our back, we face a terrible consequence. And we shall suffer a condemnation. We shall suffer the carrying out of a sentence. And when we suffer it, if we're like Pilate and didn't repent, for eternity, you'll have no complaint. Because you'll understand that, that everything that God did was absolutely righteous, absolutely fair, absolutely just, and that God has only behaved in a way which is perfectly in accord with his perfect character. So you have to say, or you have to recognize, you say, yes, my life isn't the way it ought to be, and that's my fault, because it's my fault, I'm responsible, because I'm responsible, I must face up to the awful possibility of a punishment. So he takes God into consideration. He takes his own sin into consideration and the inevitable consequences. And then he says this, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, 
and done nothing wrong. He recognized that there's something unique about Jesus Christ. That you, sometimes you hear people speak about people that they've, they've really enjoyed, they love them, and occasionally at the end of it they'll say, but. And there's a but, well, but he loses his temper, or but he hits the bottle a bit too hard, or but. There's, a, there's often a but about some of the best characters. There's no but about the character of Jesus. His life was absolutely perfect. And this man hanging in his death throes sees Jesus and there's something about the way that Jesus has behaved which makes this man say, he's different to us. What has he heard? He's heard a man about to die a very cruel death. And his only reaction is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he sees in that a revelation of the heart of God. Not the power of God. They've seen the power of God in miracles. Now they see a revelation of the heart of God. They see Jesus Christ surrendering to weakness and bearing the sins of the world upon his own shoulder. And he recognizes there's something absolutely unique about this man. And then he does something that we have to do. So far he's been talking to the other thief. So far he's been in a conversation with his old buddy. And he said, do you not fear God, seeing that we are in the same condemnation and we indeed justly? But this man had done nothing amiss. And then he prays. Then he addresses Jesus and he says, Lord. That's a simple word, isn't it? That's the word of surrender. <coughs> this man is actually surrendering, not to an idea. He's, received, he's surrendering to the person of Jesus Christ. He is giving up the control of his life to another person, a man who is hanging on a cross. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Somehow he knows that this isn't the end for this man on the center cross. He knows that there's more, and he says, Lord, remember me. <laughs> I'm just thinking, Herod received no word at all from Jesus. He had seared his conscience. And made it insensitive. Pilate had quite a few words with Jesus, but in the end, he washed his hands of it and tried to obliterate this meeting he had to solve his own conscience. This man, the lowest of the low, he's died the death of a common criminal, he's dying on the cross, and in moments, he turns to Christ and he hears Christ say, Truly, today, you will be with me in paradise. If Herod continued in his way, Herod will remember his behavior for Christ forever. If Pilate continued in his way, Herod will remember his attitude to Christ forever. If you continue in your way in closing Christ, you will remember this day forever. But if like this thief, you recognize God's being and God's involvement in your life. If you recognize that sin has its consequence and that you will be justly punished. If you recognize that Jesus is not dying for his own sin, but for the sins of the whole world. If you then turn in simplicity and call upon him and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You may not hear the words. But you'll have the same guarantee that Jesus gave you this thief. And I believe I have the right to pass this message on to you. If you reach out to Jesus Christ and then say, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm believing that you didn't die for your own sin, but for mine. I'm believing that you are coming into your kingdom. I'm believing that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. I say this, I believe with God's authority. When you die, that moment, that day, you will be with Him in paradise. And for eternity, you will have the joys and the remembrances of His goodness and His kindness. And you will praise Him and love Him and enjoy Him forever. So we must make our choices, friends. And God insists that we make this choice. You can't just 
Like Gary said, you can't sit on the fence with this. Pilate was trying to sit on the fence, you can't do it. You have to make a choice. And the choice you make will determine your destiny. Not what you have done, what you do today will determine your destiny. Let's pray. Father, these are really sobering things. I tremble as I say them. I'm speaking to men and women here, some of whom may not have bent their knee and surrendered to you and who maybe have never realized that they're actually hellbound. That they must suffer eternal separation from you unless they make their choices to turn from their old way and turn to you and surrender their lives to you. And I pray with all my heart for everybody here. I hope I haven't offended any new guests or people who are not used to this kind of meeting, but sometimes the wounds of a friend are faithful. And if I've disturbed people, Lord, I pray that you will come and bring your own unique comfort and bring them to the place where they yield to you and know in their heart that you have received them, you've included them in your plans for eternity and that should they leave this earth this very day, they'll be with you in paradise. I pray now Lord for the work of your spirit on every heart here in this building that you will bring us face to face with this moment of destiny. Make it crystal clear to our conscience that now is the day of choice. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Amen.